Welcome back to Learning Journal. In the earlier video, we started our discussion on Spark SQL. I talked about Spark SQL command line tool. I also covered create database and create table statements. I showed you some Hive queries and you learned that if you already know Hive, you can use that knowledge with Spark SQL. As I discussed in the earlier video, Spark offers many interfaces to execute your SQL statements. But do you understand which one is appropriate for you? When should I use what? The answer to that question is straightforward. It depends on what you want to do. And that's the topic for this video. I prefer to place my DDLs into a script that execute it using a Spark SQL command line tool. SQL is quite powerful. We use DDLs to create objects like database, schema, tables and views. But in most of the cases, that DDL is executed just once. It is a one-time activity for new deployment. And hence, DDLs make more sense to be placed in a script file that we can run in the target environment. And that's where I use command line tool. Here is a simple example. You can place below Spark DDL script in a file. Then you can move this script to your target environment and execute it from the command line. The above script is a simple example to give you an idea of the process. In the above example, I am creating a database, an external table and finally a view over the external table. If you notice the DDL statement for creating an external table, you will realize that we are not using a create external table statement. The create external table statement is a HiveQL syntax. But since we wanted to create a Spark SQL external table, we used Spark SQL syntax. And Spark SQL doesn't have create external table statement. The method to create an external table in Spark is as simple as to define a path option or a location parameter. Great. The second part of the SQL is the DML. I prefer using Apache Zeppelin or some other notebook while developing and testing my SQL queries. Those SQL queries might become part of a view and ultimately they get a place in the DDL script. I may end up using some of the SQLs in data transformation pipelines. No matter where I use them, but while developing, testing and visualizing the outcome of my SQL, I use a notebook interface. And that's where the notebooks excel. We use them for SQL development or exploratory analysis. Let me give you a quick demo of Zeppelin. I am using Google Cloud Platform for all my demos as well as my other POCs. And I recommend the same to all my viewers. I have already covered the steps to create a multi-node Hadoop Spark cluster in Google Cloud. However, we did not configure Zeppelin earlier. Let's create a new 3-node Hadoop Spark cluster and configure Zeppelin as well. I have already covered a step-by-step -step process to create a Hadoop Spark cluster in Google Cloud. I am not going to repeat the details here. Check out my earlier video for detailed procedure. In that video, we configured Jupyter Notebook using an initialization action. In this video, we will configure Zeppelin Notebook using a different initialization script. Use the following shell script. The above script is developed by GCP team and it is available to all of us from a public Google Cloud bucket. Great. Hit the create button and GCP will create a Spark cluster and integrate Zeppelin. We installed and configured Zeppelin. It is available to us at the masternode URL at port 8080. To connect to the Apache Zeppelin web interface, you will need to create a SSH tunnel and use SOX5 proxy. I have explained this process earlier. Let me quickly show you the steps once again. Install Google Cloud SDK. The link to download the SDK is available on my website. Once downloaded, Start the SDK installer on your local machine and follow the on-screen instructions. Once you have the SDK, you should be able to use gcloud and gutil command line tools. Use below command to create an SSH tunnel. 
you should make sure that you specify the zone name and the master node name correctly the above command should launch a new window minimize all the windows the next step is to start a new browser session that uses sox5 proxy through the tunnel start a new terminal start your browser using the command shown below the above command should launch a new chrome browser session you should be able to access the zeppelin ui once you have zeppelin you can create a new notebook give a name to your notebook choose your interpreter apache spark is the default interpreter and that's what we want great now you can execute shell commands using percent h binding let me give you a quick demo i have this survey data file let me create a google storage bucket good now i am going to upload a csv data file into my bucket great now we are ready to play with this data you can execute a shell command to see the list of files in your google bucket let me copy this file to a hdfs location use below command let's check the file now we are ready to execute some spark sql commands let's create a database you can execute an sql command using the percent sql binding let's create an external table using the hdfs file that we copied in the earlier step now you might want to explore the data quickly let's look at the distribution of ages in this data set you can look at the output as a table or you can visualize it i hope you get a sense of the spark notebooks they are an excellent tool for data scientists as well as the developers from one single interface you can execute shell commands sql scala code and a variety of other things the next method is the jdbc odbc connection the jdbc and then odbc connectors are the most straightforward i hope you already understand the anatomy of jdbc odbc in a typical jdbc odbc setup you need two things at the database side you need a listener process and there comes a new tool called spark thrift server spark thrift server is a service that allows jdbc and odbc clients to run spark sql queries so if you want to connect to spark sql database using jdbc odbc you need to make sure that the thrift server is properly configured and running on your spark cluster that was the first thing the next thing that you will need is a jdbc odbc driver if you want to use jdbc then you need a jdbc driver if you want to use odbc then you need odbc driver the driver is nothing but a set of apis and you need them on the client side that's it once you have these two things properly installed and configured you should be able to establish a jdbc or a odbc connection there are three more questions when to use jdbc odbc how to get jdbc odbc drivers and how to use these connections let's talk about the first question there are two scenarios when you might want to use this type of connection you are creating a dashboard using some bi visualization tool and you want to pull some data from the spark database tableau is one of the most popular bi tools in this category you are developing a custom web based application and you want your app server to pull some data from the spark in both of these scenarios you can directly connect to spark sql and pull the data over jdbc or odbc connection let's talk about the next question thrift server is part of spark distribution so you don't have to buy that separately it comes along with the spark however the drivers are not freely available if you are using tableau you should get it from tableau similarly other bi vendors also supply their versions of these drivers 
if you are using a commercial version of apache spark for example databricks hortonworks or cloudera you should get these drivers from your spark vendor now the third question how to use these connections i'll give you a quick demo of jdbc connection however let me raise another important point a lot of people don't prefer to use spark jdbc or odbc connections at all i mean most of the time you don't even need these drivers why because instead of connecting to spark you will find a more efficient alternative how let's try to understand that apache spark is more of a big data computation platform it is designed to perform computations on a huge volume of data however spark is not a good system for satisfying concurrent users and sub second response time expectations your bi reports and your web based applications are most likely to have a bunch of concurrent users most of the time these users need a response back in seconds apache spark is not good for that so we use spark to perform computations and push the results into a different system that may be an efficient rdbms or cassandra or maybe something else once you do that there is no need for your bi tool or the application to connect to spark well that said but you have the capability at your disposal so let's see a simple example i can't show you a jdbc or an odbc connection from tableau due to licensing problems however we have beeline tool to test a jdbc connection the beeline is a command line sql tool that comes with a bundled jdbc driver for spark so we don't need to install a driver i'll be using beeline for this demo the first thing that we need is to configure and start the thrift server google data proc cluster comes with a pre configured thrift server however it is configured to connect to hive database instead of spark sql let me show you start beeline now you can connect to thrift server using following jdbc connection url it will ask you for the username and password we haven't configured any credentials so you can simply press enter twice great it shows the message as connected to apache hive using hive jdbc driver but we wanted to connect to spark sql to fix this problem i may have to install and configure spark thrift server from scratch to avoid all those unnecessary things let me come back to my local mode spark vm and show you the jdbc connection we need to start the thrift server you can start it using the following command great the spark thrift server is up and running let's start beeline and try a jdbc connection good you can see the message as connected to spark sql using hive jdbc driver now you can execute any spark sql query from beeline your bi tools like tableau uses the same mechanism to connect to the spark thrift server the final and the most important option is the programmatic interface for spark sql the programmatic interface is the most effectual method and it helps you to model most of your requirements it is like a combined power of sql and the scala programming language or maybe python programming language If you worked in Oracle you already know that the PL SQL and the SQL together are much more powerful using programmatic method we primarily interact with the spark sql database objects using a variety of apis the most common api is the spark.sql let's quickly look at an example In this example we pass the spark sql string to the spark.sql method 
The SQL method executes the statement and returns the result as a Spark data frame. The SQL method allows you to run a DML as well as a DDL statement. That means you can query a table or a view. You can also create a new table or a view. However, it is unlikely that you will be executing a create table statement using this method. You might be creating temporary views. Let's see an example. The return data frame DF has nothing to show because we executed a DDL that doesn't return any data. Your temporary view is ready to use. You can query that view in the next statement. It is a common practice to build an intermediate view and then use it for the next step in your transformation job. So, the SQL API allows you to execute Spark SQL and HiveQL from inside your Scala programs. There are few other APIs as well. I have listed some of them for your reference. We have already seen the create or replace temp view API. That API allows you to create a temporary view using a data frame. The next one gives you a data frame out of the given table. It is equivalent to a select star from a table. The insert into will push the data frame to an existing table. The save as table can write a data frame to Spark SQL database as a table. This API can be used to create a table as well as load the data using a single API call. In the earlier video, we created a parquet table using the create table statement. But we couldn't load the data into that table. Now you know two methods to load the data into that table. Here is the code to load the data from a CSV source to a parquet table using the insert into API. Here is another alternative to loading the data from a CSV source to a parquet table using the save as table API. In this example, we are using append mode to load the data into an existing table. The above code assumes that the table already exists and we don't want to overwrite the existing record. That is why we are using the append mode. If you don't want to keep the existing record, you can truncate the old records using truncate table SQL statement to load the fresh data into the same table. You can also use the truncate table SQL followed by the insert into API that I showed earlier. Both the methods are essentially same. If you don't have the table, and want to create a table as well as load the data as a single API call, you can do that as well using the save as table API. Here is the code example. Great! You are working in a traditional data warehouse environment or you are doing something in a modern data lake environment. Data engineering process is one of the most time consuming and complex things. Half of the project time goes in extracting the data from a source system, validating it and correcting and filtering the data. Then another 25% of the time goes to perform a bunch of transformation to prepare and load the data into a target table that is more suitable for the data science and machine learning algorithms to work. Those things are not simple. You can't do all that using SQL. You'll need a programmatic interface and a scripting language to accomplish all those things. And that's where the Spark Data Frame API is used, either in Scala or in Python. However, there are a lot of things that are more convenient to achieve using SQL. And that's where the ability to mix in Data Frame API and Spark SQL is amazingly powerful. To get a more realistic sense of this notion, you might want to see a bigger and a realistic example. I mean, doing all these small and simple examples are good to learn the core capabilities and to understand the minute details of the working. However, to get a bigger picture and a notion of how these things work together in a real life project, you need some end to end examples. And I understand that. By the end of this training, I'll include some micro projects to cover few realistic end to end examples. Great! 
I talked about all the four alternatives to interact with Spark SQL database. I also talked about different scenarios to help you choose the right tool. In the next video, we'll cover few more things of Spark SQL. Thank you for watching Learning Journal. Keep learning and keep growing.